This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by Bank on Yourself. If you've ever wanted to live in a world of endlessly fascinating conversation about the arts, science, and philosophy, you're going to love my guest today. She's Anna Gott, and she's the person behind a membership platform called Interintellect, which hosts hundreds of online salons a year. Some of them feature superstars like Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker, relationship guru Esther Perel, and economist Tyler Cowen. But all of them are built around civil, yet intense and fun discussions of the most interesting cultural ideas at play. Interintellect's stated ambition is to reinvent French salon culture for the 21st century, and the platform is increasingly doing events in real life as well. I talked with Anna about why she started Interintellect, how it grew to have tens of thousands of participants all over the world, and how her new podcast, The Hope Access, fits into her vision of a future marked by optimism. We also talk about how her early years in post-communist Hungary shape her interests and ambitions and her belief that free and open culture is vital to any flourishing society. Here is The Reason Interview with Anna Gott. Okay, so uh, Anna Gott, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. I love Reason, and I always wanted to be reasonable enough to be on your podcast. Okay, well, that day has come true. Uh, let's talk about Interintellect, which is a rebirth of a French literary salon, according to your website. What is inter- intellect and uh, you know what, what are you trying to accomplish with it? Other than being unpronounceable, we're working on that. Um, every time I go on a podcast where there is a person who speaks for a living and even they can't pronounce it, I know yeah. we have a problem and we have to yeah. fix it. We're on it. In terms of, I mean, currently it's a curated marketplace of events for artists and intellectuals a kind of high culture creator space mm-hmm. where people from academia, journalism, you know, makers and builders can basically create their own communities outside traditional gatekeepers. Um, I really love that we are able to bring together people from, you know, a 15 year old kid from India who just happened to have, you know, um, read everything. Um, yeah. And some of the greatest intellectuals and artists alive today, uh, we um, are a place where you can uh, I mean, it, yeah. talk about, uh, you know, at the website, you have online events and in person or in yeah. real life events. Um, when did Interintellect start? Um, and I mean, how so, important? Yeah. So, so first, firstly, in terms of structure, it's a completely public marketplace. So you can mm-hmm. go there and book a ticket and go to any event. And it's great right. for the host and the guests because they make money on it. Um, but we also have a community tier, and I think this is what you're referring to, where people who do this, you know, as a very serious part of their lives, um, they also get to go to offline events. They also get to hang out in the community forum mm-hmm. or, you know, get perks and members on special events for them as well. So it's kind of like it has a more public and a more private gated part right. at this. At this and point. you talk about how, you know, what is salon culture and... I mean, you started this while you were living in London. You now are based in New York. What what was going on that, you know, in the capitals of the developed world, uh, you know, salon culture seemed to have petered out sometime, I don't know, you know, in the 1960s, in the 1920s. Um, what What is the gap that you're hoping to fill? I love that question. Um, so I think it was a very, very long journey. I'm originally Hungarian. I'm a political immigrant from from Budapest. You know, I lived there for, for the first 30 years, almost fully, you know, spent there um, uh, in my life. Um, and then at some point, the discourse, the politics, the scene just deteriorated to a point where I, I knew I had to, I had to leave. Um, and what I went, year was that that so you left? So, so my, immig- my immigration process was really between 2011 and 2013. And then in 2013, I moved to London. I got a scholarship um, at a university there. Um, to, to basically go back into theater. I spent mm-hmm. my 20s working in music, uh, building communities around 
music, mm-hmm. you know, musical communities can be politically very polarized. Yep. Uh, and then I worked on a very uh, successful nonprofit um, in Budapest, which was then the biggest women's rights platform. Again, we sought to bring together people from all yep. parts of Asia, all levels of education, to create really simple conversations about women's rights that are neither from an activist, you know, perspective, mm-hmm nor something so academic that a lay person yeah. can't relate to or even understand what's when called. when you said that the situation in hungary had kind of uh deteriorated what are you talking about i mean where to begin the breakdown of democratic institutions mm-hmm. civil society um the disappearance of the free press and the stifling of any funding or access to you know yeah. um, access to resources that is you know needed for an artistic community to flourish right still- and budapest in particular had a phenomenal i mean it was one of the most cosmopolitan cities in european history right so it must yeah, be yes. you know between I mean, the it, communism it was, I and don't know. i always think yeah it has it's it's a lovely place but you yeah. know sometimes second tier cities famously you know, confuse themselves with Paris or Vienna. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Vienna even could be um, uh, viewed as a second tier city. I'm happy to, to yeah. consider everything, even even Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island as second tier cities. So, oh my um, God. Yeah, I think probably right. everything that's, uh, that's in the middle of Manhattan considers yeah. itself in some sense. And But it, it can be good. I mean, being yeah. second tier, being not the incumbent, can be an extremely creative and generative place to be where you have a gigantic, you know, complex of inferiority and you will work mm-hmm. your butt off to excel in some field. And, so you know, you move to, to you, then you, that can lead to success. Sadly, Budapest chose to specialize to something extremely sinister at some point, And mm-hmm. it basically made a generation of the intelligentsia flee. I was one of those people. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why interintellect came to be what it is, and I am happy to go through the very, very long process of experimentation, was because I started seeing similar things happening in the West. And even though I had prepared to be a kind of passive artistic participant in society, there was a moment in 2016 when I felt that it would be immoral of me not to try to at least do something, because I'm not going to just go gentle into that good night. Um, but at first, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, when I was, I had twelve years of experience in screenwriting and playwriting. You know, I had studied dramaturgy, I studied language philosophy, I had philosoph- art philosophy, like super lucrative fields, right? Um, English, um, and you know, at first, I thought maybe this is going to be a think tank. Maybe my academic background will come in handy here, and we will just do adversarial research and try to, you know, prevent discourse breakdown through incredible research of people. Um, then, you know, that kind of led to, okay, do we need to build a tool that helps people communicate better? Is this going to be an AI-mediated chat app that helps you resolve conflict? It really threw me down into an ex- so, excellent... But, but the center was that you wanted to kind of facilitate better and deeper conversations. The uh, center, built the center was me sitting on my bed in London in the summer of 2016, you know, knowing that Brexit was about to happen, knowing that Trump was about to happen, having these very dark premonitions that were more deja vu than anything else, and feeling that, okay, I had spent my life thinking about what I can't do, all the things I'm not qualified for. And I thought, you know, I was sitting on my bed and I told, just said to myself, oh no, nobody gives a damn about your anxieties. Like, what can you do? And I literally went through my own CV in my mind and I thought, okay, if I really had to do something, what would that be? and created this kind of ikigai thing in my head that I didn't even know ikigai existed at the time, where I was looking at, okay, what am am I qualified for? What is an unanswered need in society? What is something Mm -hmm. where I think new technologies will be soon built and that there can be an upward curve? And also what is something that I'm so deeply passionate about that even on my worst day, you know, and boy, did I get what I asked for, we had COVID, right? right? So I did check, you know, that that was actually checked in reality. What would be something that I'm so excited about that I can just go and make, and make it happen and, and make other people excited about it? Right. And it left me with this big question, which was that I am a pro at helping fictional characters have excellent conversations, but they don't need help. It's the real people who do. 
Mm-hmm. And then I went back and, you know, that's, that was literally the first time when I realized, oh my God, actually my background in music, and I was very, very successful at, 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 at you know, managing bands and building um, audiences. And music is extremely pure. Like if people don't like the music that they're hearing, they will leave. There's no stated preference. It's pure revealed preference. It's amazing. You learn a lot from that. Um, but also the NGO work, which I always thought was just, you know how when people are really good at something, they don't focus on it because it's easy for them. So that was how it was for me to just build the biggest women's rights platform in Budapest, kind of like after hours on my phone, f- five minutes a day. And then I realized like, oh, actually that's a talent and that's something that's inc- incredibly useful. But I had no idea. And really the current form of Internet Act, which started as very low tech, we're only now building technology after mm-hmm. having done this for five years. Really only started early 2019 when I kind of had this thought experiment that the best companies in the world would survive the apocalypse. Let me tell you. So there's an apocalypse and there's no electricity, no Wi-Fi. The infrastructure has broken down. Google still exists. Is this guy sitting under the tree, Jim, and you can go to him and ask him, hey, where does Nick live? And he's like, hell's kitchen, turn left at the third cave, right? Or... Airbnb still exists. It's somebody who tells you and Sarah, like, there is this amazing cave by the ocean. People like you really liked it. Or, you know, uh, Facebook still exists. It's like this gossipy grandma at the campfire who's like, I was out a lot these days. And, you know, she's been seen with people. And I thought, okay, what would that be for internet fact? I had been so adamant, like, build tech, build tech. I have to code, build tech. I was like, what would be the part of Interinsag that would literally survive an apocalypse? And like, we can't, there's this non-zero chance for an apocalypse. This is not a bad way of thinking about stuff. Right. This was before Tyler blocked me on Twitter also. So I was still more exposed to apocalyptic thinking. And I thought, well, that's it. We're just like hanging out somewhere and trying to have a conversation that doesn't make anybody leave. That is a place where you can talk about what was the uh, what was the first salon that you did, and was it online or was it in real life? The most, um, the first thing that we did was um, in Dolores Park in 2019, which was just a picnic, and we were just mm-hmm. exchanging ideas about how we felt underserved by the current political discourse or mm-hmm. cultural fields and movements. We felt we were intellectual orphans, mm-hmm. and. Who is we in that? Um, like, a, describe a, yeah, what's the range of people. Together from tech, philosophy, mm-hmm. writers, mm-hmm. artists, people who felt they were extremely engaged in creating culture, but they didn't feel the scene. I have this theory that in retrospect, we will be named something, but you never know what you are at the time. And oftentimes, you know, there is a scene that even tries to name itself, and then history completely disregards that and renames them. You right. Know, how Every era is pre something, but you don't know pre what you are. Right. Or post something, right? Or post something. Yeah. The thing, first yeah. one more, I didn't know it was the first. Um, yeah. and, and I kept thinking about it. And, you know, post liberal, I think, wasn't a really colloqu- a colloquialism yet. Um, but we, we were talking about post political, mm-hmm. like post partisan political. And this was kind of, you know, five years ago, preceding a lot of the reshuffling that we are currently seeing in politics and what the Hope X is also is about which is that what does left and right even mean? And oftentimes it's useful for somebody to come from abroad. There's a reason why, you know, immigrants have been known to build, I mean, your family is well, like known to build exceptional things in America because you have this other view on that where you think, okay, but right doesn't necessarily just mean these two things that you think it means on this particular day in August, 2024. It is a, it is a vessel of a lot of different things and it's worth seeing the nuances yeah i, I view everybody and i always say that a, a, an intern like host is doing a good job when he or she is able to make things more complicated or at least keep things complicated we're not looking for the bullet points we're not looking for the do these five things to have a right. perfect life we're yeah. looking for something where you're sitting and thinking boy nobody actually figured out the biggest answers to the biggest questions. So if, if I may uh, just put a, some kind of flesh on these bones that you're talking about, you've got a couple of online events that are listed at the interintellect.com page. One, you're, uh, you're moderating. It's called If Love Could Kill, a deep dive into female violence with Anna Motz. And then there's one called AI in the Future of Work. Um, 
what is, you know, what's the conversation that you're hosting about female violence? What um, how do you how do you keep people in the room for that? That's going to be in New York City tomorrow with Anna Motz, who is a forensic psychologist um, researching female violence, working with female um, offenders and working in a mm-hmm. female prison. So here we have somebody who is really working at the edges of the Overton window and how we're able to discuss the role of women violence against women, systemic problems, but also the kind of dark underbelly that we're not supposed to talk about. What happens when a, the woman in the family is the abuser? How, how do we think about it? And how does you know the wide-eyed theory of academics contrast with the lived reality of somebody who's being paid to help people in some of the hardest moments in their lives. And so we will have people, this is an offline event, so this is members only. We will have people from our New York community or surrounding Mm -hmm. states, sometimes people drive over, um, have a really wide ranging multidisciplinary conversation. And this we have people who are psychologists themselves. We always have a professional audience, which is super exciting. Um, And we will also have complete lay people who are just really interested and who want to widen their horizons intellectually in a way that is not one way. It's not just reading a substack. It's actually, they come to speak themselves. And, ask and so, and then the, the other, uh, another uh, one, you know, this will air AI after here. these have ha- happened, but this is AI in the future of work. And that's online. How do the <laughs> online? Know yeah. Uh, it says uh, returning host and AI enthusiast, Dave Crouch. For an Dave open Crouch. conversation That's about artificial intelligence, in something on my platform of the many, many, many events. Yeah. I have no idea. I would imagine they would have, you know, an AI event on interintellect, knowing mm-hmm. like our community and audience, public audience, knowing how safe and multi intellectually, you know, yeah. uh, diverse these conversations are and multidisciplinary. We'll probably have half of the room who are complete AI doomers, and the uh-huh. other half will be people who are building AI themselves and, are and that'll be that happens online so that's like via zoom or a zoom like which will bring in the beautiful element of the variety of geographies who can call yeah. in mm-hmm. I always tell my online hosts that you will have people f- phoning in in their pajamas and that's fine because 4 a.m in India is always 4 a.m somewhere as we found out so there is this this trade-off that our hosts make when you know, if you choose to do something offline, you will have the in-person experience. If you're live streaming, a kind of hybrid experience. But there is something about access where you can't really replace an online event. And especially people who are on book tours, who are doing these, lo- like, who are focusing on locales, for them having something, you know, you're publishing a book in America, you're publishing a book in the UK, you have these extremely location-specific ways to promote it and sometimes i mean people buy books online all the time like why shouldn't you have somebody call in from australia or thailand or uganda why would that come why would that not enrich the conversation and sometimes you have to have people learn from each other right like we had conversations online that were and this is me not pushing. I, the beauty of interinteract, and this is why I chose to take it into a very low tech, kind of low governance um, area or direction. Like we're not telling people to be open minded, geographically conscious, have major realizations, being exposed to people from different you know, persuasions or geographies or generations or fields, you know, professional fields. It just kind of happens because you let it happen, and there's always. A theme there's always a topic so you're not coming in to talk about politics or whether people should have kids you come in to talk about Dostoevsky or Thomas Sass or yeah. the history of the steam engine and yes so you're I'm getting sure. the uh, Hungarians in there right oh, yeah, Thomas always, always the great a uh, long time he had been a very long time contributing editor to uh, to Reason magazine really Ooh. not surprisingly Thomas Sass uh, oh, yeah. the Hungarian born anti psychiatry psychiatrist He's a nerd favorite today did but, you know that all the nerds that? Francisco oh, yeah. I, him. okay I can see that um, so I mean what you've done kind of like Substack but it's for conversation like in real time where you create a structure and then the hosts and the guests kind of sort out what they're going to talk about and they engage one another. Absolutely. And I host my events 
as a kind of way to both experiment different formats. I always want to try my mm -hmm. own medicine on myself first before we say yeah. to people, hey, do this. Mm -hmm. um, but also to, you know, I feel like the more hosts we have and from the, you know, more and more geographies that we do, the more the formats start diverging and mutating. Right. It's amazing. And so I host my events to kind of continue doing the standard so people don't forget mm -hmm. what the kind of right. version of this is. Um, when people ask, you know, oh, do, do we have two salons like you do? I'm like, no, I do them to kind of continue having this baseline. And as a creator, your job is to be creative and iterate yeah. on it and, and make it yours. Yeah, and I, there's such a wide. I'm just scrolling through the list of uh, salons. There's one uh, about the cult of celebrity that features Tara Isabel, oh, yes. Green, who's, about this new series. who's been a guest. Utopia for builders: an inside look into the edge uh, as the yeah. camp. Yeah. These are um, yeah. yeah why do you uh, Julia Zonavant, who wrote a book mm -hmm. called Charm with Princeton University Press. She works at the New School mm -hmm. um, as a professor. Um, she was finally my classmate at university in Budapest, very randomly. She was mm -hmm. a genius and I was a little weirdo. And it's so funny that we now both live in the same city and kind of yeah. work in the same industry and are still friends. Um, so it's a very big deal for me. I've never, I don't think I've ever had a former classmate or maybe Christopher yeah. Hogg who was my classmate, um, in London. He is running an exceptionally good, uh, comedy writing and memoir writing, um, uh, series, um, uh, online. Yeah. And the hosts, I mean, people pay to be part of the community and to go to the events, and then the hosts get some of that money. This was, um, you That's received- can I, can, I, can I go back to that? So, yeah. well, not everybody pays us. Um, we have yearly, um, monthly memberships and also super supporter that is for 10 years. Um, but we do have student fellows, like we have a six month student fellowship uh, where the students don't pay, you have to apply for it. Um, so our hosts make money on their events. Yeah. We make money on the memberships. Right. Okay. So that's our model. Um, it's going to further go towards members go free for everything as opposed to having limitations on it, or at least there will be more tiers um, in the new site um, or new platform. Um, but that's that's how it's been. I'm really how um how many events do you host a year, would you say? Myself can, or the platform? No, the the whole platform. We have a couple of events a day these days. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So this is just like a, a, I mean, a salon or it's like an endless party where you can dip in and out of That's different exactly rooms. It. It's yeah. like my, it's like an, it's like a perpetual festival. Yeah. I, I love Monica L. Smith. Um, uh, sociologist has this theory that cities came to be, you know, through our, you know, the evolution of cities. If we go to go back to Tapa or even earlier, probably there were, a lot of older cities, we just have no material proof. And that these were temporary locations, right? Like, I mean, the dawn of everything is all about this temporality and how people spend half a year hunting and half a year gathering, blah, 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 or half a year doing agriculture. So the same was true for cities. These were festival grounds, like Burning Man, a temporary city, right? People came together once or twice a year to trade goods, find their spouses, get exposed to new ideas and party, 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 eat each other's food. It's amazing. And the people love this. And Monica L. Smith's theory is that we just moved into the festival grounds. Like New York City is a festival ground. Like you can have any food, party at any time. Everything is open, access to all the books, all the people. And I, this is how I see Interinsect. This is why I call it an, an online city, right? We have citizens and they are our members. Because it's like, what if there could be a better way to run a community a city when it comes to language and how we actually share values and thoughts with each other. And what if that was ongoing? Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Bank on Yourself, a retirement plan alternative. Most of us have been told the only way to have enough money to retire is to put your life savings into a 401k or IRA and then bank on Wall Street. But if that were true, why do studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by a staggering 10 years? Get the truth and discover a better way to grow and protect your money. Bank on Yourself is a proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping that you never hear about. It gives you guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income. 
With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go south whenever the markets tumble. You're also in control with Bank on Yourself. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and no government penalties or restrictions on how much money you can take or when you can take it. You also get peace of mind. You'll know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day you plan to tap into them and at every point along the way. Learn the secret to safely and predictably grow your wealth every single year, enjoy tax-free retirement income, and gain control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash word, and they'll send you a free report about the retirement plan alternative that lets you bypass banks and Wall Street and take back control of your financial future. That's bankonyourself.com slash word, W-O-R-D, for your free report. Go to bankonyourself.com slash W-O-R-D. And now back to the reason interview. So you, you know, you said this is you, you don't have a political agenda, a particular political agenda. I and I it's, think do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's kind of cultural. It's really kind of pre-political, although some of the events are about yeah. political topics and things like that. Yeah, we yeah, have I a, mean, we're very we much partisan politics. We have a no no yeah. missionary clause, basically right. in our rules, which is that you can't sell anything. Religion, politics. Yeah. Um, but you know, it seems like you're very much in the tradition of a, a kind of grand European liberal tradition of the idea that you know more conversation or open conversation and being able to talk freely and share ideas and critique ideas. Clearly, that's one of the foundational elements of of interintellect, right? Yeah, definitely. There's a strong element of kind of classical humanism here. Mm-hmm. You deeply trust people's intelligence, virtue, intentions, and the idea that provided that, you know, the classic stressors of fear, distress, uncertainty are removed in a situation, even if it's yeah. a temporary situation. Right. People will be at their best selves. And I, I mean, we have had zero incident at Interintellect. And all we do all day is bring together complete strangers in a very low, moderated environment. And we simply do this by creating a situation where, first of all, this is why, why the community theory is so important. Because if you are a member at Interintellect, you have the identity around these norms, and we don't have to you know, artificially or or manually moderate, the community will moderate itself in some sense. And also there is no incentive. Like you go to a dinner party and misbehave, all you will you know, achieve is you won't be invited anymore. So if you pay to go to an interinteract event, why, first of all, it's not public. You, it's not going to get you followers. You're just losing money and friends and your reputation. And so people don't do that. Also the, ins- the the kind of upside and the reward is through engagement. And I think people want the reward. I mean, obviously you do. So this has been working at this scale. I'm sure we will have different problems when we grow. Right. Uh, but so far- About how many, been, yeah, how many members do you have or how many, how many people have passed through the rooms of the intro? I think we've had around, I don't know the exact number, but around 30,000, 35,000 people in wow. and out so, so far. So like a good- a, 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 Big small university town. or a small town of just people yeah. kind of talking at each other. I see, yeah, I think like this is this is what you get growing up on Richard Scary. All you want yeah. to do is create a little town, you know, yeah. with the bunny right. and the bear, and like one goes to the dentist and the other grows. Yeah, the yeah, that's how you should imagine it. So I mean, um, offline what, town, right? like we have colleagues and and, and semi competitors who do the kind of set we, we do like we have hubs mm-hmm. like a church right. you know, in the world yeah. in North America. And I travel a lot and I and I I, I Yeah and you have so you have places in London, in um, in San Francisco, in New York. So our main hubs mm-hmm. are um, San Francisco, LA, now San Diego, Austin, Miami, DC, um, New York, Boston, mm-hmm. Philly, up and coming. And then yeah. we have London, Edinburgh, Berlin. Uh, Lisbon, um, and then Bangalore, Singapore. Wow. These are the hubs so far, yeah. Some yeah. stuff in Mumbai, but less. less. Part of, let's, uh, you know, um, well, uh, before we go to the Hope Access podcast yeah. and, and that concept of the Hope Access, 
I just want to to close out just talking about the kind of history or emergence of venture intellect. You were uh, a grantee from the Emergent Ventures uh, group that Tyler Cowen at George Mason and the Mercatus Center uh, do. How do how do you fit into? I mean, is is part of what you're doing trying to help regrow a kind of? I mean, it's not simply an intellectual community; it's a cultural community, but it's a you know it, it's a liberal. Uh, a stubborn attachment to things like free speech and free expression and kind of trying yeah, hard to matters, you know, mm-hmm. and all these old yeah. ideas. Um, honestly, I don't know. You would have to ask Tyler. I was the mm-hmm. most surprised when I won the grant. Yeah. Um, I think there's something to sometimes the most obvious things like having an accessible diverse fulfilling cultural life and life of the mind both on the collective and the individual level is a good thing and it's worth investment and the work and some of this time you know we maybe you and i take this for granted but actually very few people do it really seriously like since internet tech started i mean it's like a battle royale we had I've seen 500 similar projects rise and fall. Almost everybody who comes into Intrinsect will say, at Yale, we had a group like this. In, I don't know, uh, uh, Wichita, Kansas, we had a group like this. In Bristol, UK, we had a group like this. And then after a few months, they were gone. So I think it also needs a kind of obsessed cycle like myself, who just wakes up every day, seven days a week, all year round. And just continues doing it because for me, this is easy in a very yeah. masochistic and untrue way. Well, let's also talk, you know, then about. Maybe, the- so, uh, yeah, just to kind of like wrap yeah. it up. So, so I think Tyler, probably who sees all these applications, mm-hmm. has a better idea of what is something that actually there is a lot of, despite perception, and not mm-hmm. many of. And probably yeah. there are not actually many as well constructed kind of cultural. Right and gems as interintellect. Yeah. Um, but you would have well, to ask, like, You know, one, one of the talk. things that I know you, you have a podcast as well that started a, a few weeks yeah. ago Literally called The Hope Axis. And um, let's talk about The Hope Axis. We'll talk about it as a podcast in a second, but as a concept, you are, you, you know, you, you had kind of alluded to this earlier where you're not really talking about right and left wing, uh, but hope, is one of the axes in your kind of cosmology. What uh-huh. What is the hope access? access? So after, after I started um, the podcast a month ago, we've had four episodes so far. Um, people have been telling me that I speak too fast and the podcasts have to be like this. And I was like, I would just fall asleep. I, I can't do that. But I'm very happy that you're also not speaking super slow and we don't have to do this thing. It's good. I'm, this is, you're a pro, so I'm relieved that I'm doing maybe at least half right. <laughs> This thing. Um, so Interact has been built or and has been operating as a completely apolitical space. Um, we do have political themed events, but they are not taking sides. So for instance, Robert Nemeth from Central European University hosted an incredible series called Ideas Shape the World, where the core idea that came out of a conversation that he and I had was that so many people are talking about Marxism, fascism, anarchism, anarcho-syndicalism, whatever ism. And they haven't really read the founding texts. They talk about a French school. They talk about second wave feminism. Like, have you read the text? And we're like, let's just create a salon series where you, it's like, what is fascism? What is Marxism? Okay, let's talk about what it actually is. Because if you don't have that kind of literacy of the, of the primary source, anybody can convince you of anything. You can be a political victim to any gaslighting. How would right. you know? Um, and so, so we do have political stuff, but we never, we're not like, this is good and bad, do this, do that, right? There are no, there are declarative sentences and no imperative sentences and a lot of interrogation. Um, and I feel like, you know, my past 10 years that so greatly informed my work and my, you know, commitment to humanism, they all come from this really weird kind of um, Sergio Leone standoff between two polarities, right? Which was the woke, the wokes and conservatism. And if you really look at it from the perspective of their views on the future, um, then the wokes will, you know, one of their primary theses will be that the past was bad. Then some wokes think that it can be improved upon and some that it can't, but that the past was bad and it's something that we really need to come to terms with and process and acknowledge all of those things 
that's a core thesis. And for conservatives, it might be that the past was good. You know, there were errors, it wasn't perfect, but altogether it's something to be proud of, you know, create tributes to, educate children about, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt, you know, that first of all, of course, it's very nuanced. And you and I were both, in some cases, wokes, and in some cases, conservatives, right? Like the, the reality is always in the middle. Um, but I felt that, you know, in this political polarity, if this is our age's great dichotomy, I don't know, I don't wish to take a part in because I think it's more conservative. And I definitely want my platform in no way to engage either pro con for either things. We will discuss it. And I hope that through discussion, through hearing from all these different people, you will understand that it's very situational. It's, it really depends, et cetera, et cetera. But a couple of months ago, or maybe last year, I started noticing a different polarity. And it started, make me, it started to, to make me think whether one of the great polarities of this day is more about, it's not about whether the past was good or bad, it's more like, has the be, have the best things already happened or will they be in the future? Like Robin Hanson has this whole idea about the great filter, you know, about, to kind of try to model the likelihood of an extinction event to be in the future. And I feel that something politically around that also popped up. Um, and this gave me, as I was modeling it, a new kind of axis. And I think this is what I hold a, a hope axis. On the one end, and this is very personal for me because this is totally my field, um, who I call public nostalgics. Mm -hmm. With capital P, capital N, these are people who not only preserve the cultural educational, societal structures of the past, but who openly think that the future will be bad. Right. And that thinking that it will be good, that thinking that this is not the apocalypse, that thinking that we are not in hospice care, that thinking that we are not, you know, that this is not the end times to just endure until we die is a kind of sacrilege. And and this is, there's a growing movement and these are millennials and I'm and from my field and I'm like, don't do this. Like, first of all, you can't possibly think this. If you get out who of are, the can you Can you name a couple of individuals who you're thinking no. of when you talk to them? No, no but okay. it's, it's, the, it's... But it's a vibe, right? It's, it's a vibe it's that... Really, it's not always. It feels like it's this kind of force pulling on my generation mm -hmm. that people are also fighting. So they are not always indulging in it. But right. it's like the dark side, the kind of weights pulling down millennials. Can we, let me, yeah, let me ask about this. You're a millennial. Millennials yeah. are simultaneously, you know, they, on, at least in the United States, on the way up, they were going to be the next great generation. They were idealistic. Uh, the world was unfolding in front of them. Then the financial crisis hit as they were heading into the, you know, post-college labor market. Uh, and they became sour and depressed. And they are now, you know, Gen Z is the anxious generation in John Heights parlance. But, you know, it's true of millennials. And they're constantly being told and they reflect this back that they're going to have a lower standard of living than their parents, which is factually is empirically wrong, but psychologically seems to be incredibly powerful. Um, where is that coming from? Like, why would why would millennials or why would anybody under 45, say, living right now, think that the world isn't better than it used to be and that it has at least an even chance of being much better in the future than it is today? I have to tell you, Nick, that I don't know. And it bugs me terribly. And it really, really, really worries me. Um, I think you're probably right that there is something to do there with the expectations I, it, it, people are much more, I think millennials are far more unhappy in discourse than in their personal lives. And one of the things that really, really bothers me about it, and I'm going to tell you what the other end of the axis is, right? Uh, because this is just the kind of negative pole. Um, so for, for me, you know, being an Eastern European immigrant in America, seeing really wealthy, privileged people with their Apple Watch and MacBook and penicillin and uh, Peloton bike and, you know, life expectancy of 100 years and children and health insurance talk about how there is no hope and basically acting their lives, act, acting 
enacting hope through their lives, but trying to take it away inadvertently from other people. I think one of the reasons why I started to talk about it so openly was that you're not noticing the harm you are doing. Right. No, you can't write, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, an essay, an op-ed that actively robs other people of agency and hope because it's contagious in some sense. It's completely right. fine to pinpoint problems. Sad... I pinpoint problems. But yeah. then tell me, okay, or at the end say, I don't know what the solution is. Let's figure it out. That's also a completely, you don't have to, right? You and I, we both know about a lot of things that are wrong where we don't know what to do. Right. But we know that there pro probably is something. But you're And you're also zeroing in on the fact that people talk a big game about hope and despair and the new serfdom and all of that, but then they're living as if they are going to have a future and it's, and they're they will have a aggregating future. every, you know, they're, they're getting everything that they can, uh, they even as the ship is going down. And I, you have this really strange, it, it's very American, it's not the same in Europe, but you mm -hmm. have this really weird um, kind of contradiction here where people who are coming from much less and who have to work much harder actually are speaking about much more in like, they are speaking in far more encouraging terms and are expressing much more hope because they know that they have a responsibility to keep their communities going, to keep themselves going. And the discourse does matter. And I think there is something about really, really privileged uh, communities where you don't know how you talk about this stuff long enough in this really false, fake, black and white way, where it's just spiritual degradation and everybody's lonely and everybody's suicidal. It's not true. And especially not true in the circles being described or where it's coming from. And at some point it will become true. I mean, we know from society, we know from the decadent movement, we know what happened in certain periods in history, um, in culture, like you can push this long enough for people to really feel like it. And when I hear somebody not having children because of climate change, you have an actual genetically suicidal decision from somebody who is a victim of this narrative. I'm pretty sure they didn't pull it out of their own butts that having children would be I'm, best for climate. You know, people always, you know, they always have a reason not to have kids. Yeah, but then be honest. I don't have kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's then funny. And it it kind of changes, say, but it's know, overpopulation. This, it's this, this is what I'm talking about. If I yeah. say that I don't have kids because Anagat hasn't had the life situation so far mm -hmm. and I didn't want to have kids in uncertainty and poverty, yeah. that's great. I'm talking about myself. If I right. tell you that I'm not having it because the world is on fire and everything is terrible, then I will make you not have kids also. Right. And that's the social contagion of it. And here so everyone then, has yeah. a responsibility. Talk um, talk about the hope axis then. Yeah, so I mean, that's, so that's, that's the despair <laughs> axis, and then you know what what goes into the hope axis axis. So for um, me, this is personal because I'm kind of on in both communities. So mm -hmm. my background is in the humanities and in academia, yeah. and not everybody, but the large chunk of people there do feel that they have to signal by constantly professing that there is no hope, even right. though in their own lives there is far more hope than in most people's lives. Yeah. And I see that as, as irresponsible. I see that as intellectual dishonest. And I see that where some, something in our own communities, self-image and norms and what standards we hold ourselves to needs to change. The mm -hmm. other end of it is what I call the artist culture. So you have public intellectuals versus artist culture. Okay. And, and you're saying of, artist. I'm sorry, I don't want to. Autistic. Autistic. Okay. Autistic. Autist. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm kind of like borrowing this term, other thinkers have been using it in the past months. This is the future will be good. Mm -hmm. The same as we've seen with the Vox, part of these people think that it will be good, what, like indefinite optimists, like it will somehow be good, we don't have to do anything about it. And the other half thinks that it will only be good if we work really hard. That's me, right? right? Yeah. I, I dump everything here, tech, effective altruists, people who have a very, rational rationality based but very pr proactive and optimistic view on the future these are extremely reductive right like public nostalgics are also a very complicated i mean we see in america both democrats and and republicans yeah. have 
nostalgist, right? Like Everybody when, loves you know, the factory floor. Nobody wants to work in the factory, but yeah, you, know, and you, want, you like, want everybody else to be in a factory. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody, somebody tells me that I have to vote for him because he wants to be buried in Kentucky with his whatever. I'm like, yeah. is this your political program? <laughs> That you will die. That's very good for you. Nobody yeah. else will clearly. Anyway, um, and and there's artist op- op- culture, and I think almost all of the interesting political and journalistic and discourse conflicts that we see in 2024 are really the fight between these two mm-hmm. polarities. The future will so, be bad, and the future yes. will be good. So it's hope versus despair, really, or, or nostalgia versus uh, progress. Let's find a way out versus no way out yeah and again you know of course the truth is in the middle there are right. things that used to be better mm-hmm. right we used to build better baroque cathedrals during the baroque sure mm-hmm. um but to, <laughs> you know to not accept yeah. some of the upward curves that the world is producing in the most important areas to me seems insane yeah like I literally have people looking at an upward curve and be like, "No," and I'm like, "Yeah, but the children are not dying." Well, we, you know, if everybody's unhappy and you have eight billion people, you've multiplied, you know. I think unhappy. it's that the unhappy people are always louder. You know, I like to joke yeah. that um, uh, all fa- happy families are alike in that they don't yeah. post. Right. Yeah, that's very good. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but tell me who. Who are the intellectual heroes, um, you know, for you of like, who, who are the, who are the, the secular saints of the hope axis? Oh, that's such a good question. And thinking about when I read, um, as a teen, Isaac Asimov's The Tragedy Mm -hmm. of the Moon, Mm -hmm. um, which is one of his essay collections. And it's, you know, absolutely phenomenal. It is scope. He talks everything. He talks about everything from the birth of astronomy to video cassettes. It's from the mm-hmm. 80s, right? Mm-hmm. To Ruth in the Bible and wow. the fight against racism. It's, it's yeah. always incredible. Do you think is, is like understanding history or being, you know, attuned to history or, or a timeline is really important to if, you, if you're going to have hope? I mean, you, you learn the past and again, you don't learn that everything was great and now it's terrible or nothing was good. And now it's now it's better. But um, it seems like that perspective is often what goes missing in contemporary. Uh, yeah, history. I think I think obviously like having a strong kind of readership is really important in every individual's life. I mean, f- few things in life are as gratifying as having an active life of the mind or cultivating it. I think reading a lot of history is a double-edged thing. On the one hand, you will find plenty of, you know, reasons for hope, but also history was really, really bloody and difficult. And you will also find out that even the best people die, and you will too. Um, that said, it's part of the human condition and the human reality, and we should be able to face that. I don't think that, you know, mortality should take away people's ambitions. I like to joke that one of the reasons why every era since the antiquity has fantasized about an apocalypse is not because people are afraid to die. It's because you're afraid that you will die and other people won't and life will just go on. So you fantasize about everybody dying at the same time and then it's good. Um, So one of the reasons why I love Tragedy of the Moon, and this is, you know, what a place where I would start is it's, it's, it's called the Tragedy of the Moon, but it looks at two human to moon relationship um and the two sides of it there's the tragedy and kind of the glory of the moon so on the one hand you know he talks about how the space program the nuclear program you know led to often really really dark outcomes and people build weapons and then they want to use those weapons and wars have you know terrible cascading outcomes that very few people can model in advance but there's also the glory of the moon chapter, which to me was completely mind blowing, which basically is a thought experiment on how the moon's cycles led to human cognition. So he describes, as Asimov describes, this forefather of ours or foremother who goes and sits outside the cave to go back to the post apocalyptic, <laughs> um, you know, thought experimentation as well and tries to calculate what the what's going on with the moon and 
he or she has a digital system, right? Digit means fingers. Can, can divide, count, use a metric system of 10 things. Um, and, but the moon cycle is not really divisible by 10. Right. right. It gets complicated. And so before Asimov jumps into both the invention and different versions of what we call calendar today, and also he creates his own calendar, just like as you would in the middle of the night, the original note. Um, he talks about how the puzzlement of just something so reliably recurring, not being divisible by 10, annoyed early humans so much that they had to invent thinking and maybe writing and notation systems and how maybe when they went to the festival ground, you know, once or twice a year, they brought it with them and they were like, we figured it out. You know, there's the, there are fractals. And I just absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love that. Um, and this is something that, you know, I would, to me, for, for me, it's like, it's active hope. It's also realistic hope. It's not thinking that human cognition can only lead to good things, but to understanding that if we will have good things, it will come from human cognition. Hmm. All right. That's a great uh, note to end on, a uh, positive, a hopeful note. Uh, we've been talking with Anna Gott, who's the founder of interintellect.com, an online and in real life salon uh program platform as well as the uh, host of the hope access podcast anna thanks for talking to reason thank you so much Nick.